also very much in line with how at least I envision accelerating progress, which is with our people. But I think that our chief people officer at the time when she started a couple of years ago, she also created a new function, which was a head of culture. And mm. w- which was to say that we were intending to focus explicitly on our culture. And it was as part of that work that we ended up uh, refining our purpose statement and not changing our values, but re- refining the meaning of them for us. Just one final question and, and kind of along those veins, I'm really interested in how you're thinking about stakeholder relationships. So in some of the organizations we've been talking about, they're no longer just thinking about the shareholder on the outside, but also the employee, the customer, the supplier, you know, the actual shareholders, partners, society, those types of things. As you were putting putting together your purpose statement, can you talk to us a little bit about how those those groups were taken into account or if they were taken into account? They absolutely were taken into account. So if we go back, I think, to what was it, maybe the middle of 2019, I'm pretty sure it was some, somewhere in 2019, the business roundtable came out with a new statement of purpose for, for a corporation where they said, we are no longer going to live by this idea that the only purpose that a company has is to make generate profits for a shareholder, right? I.e. Milton Friedman. And that we are going to look at all of our stakeholders, our people, our customers, et cetera. And so we actually at the, it was all this time. So we we are a signatory of that business roundtable new statement, our our CEO was. And it was just at that time also that we did reshape that purpose statement. So I believe that that purpose statement is very much in line with accelerating progress. And and I guess the way I look at it is, I first of all, I think you need to make an assumption that, in, you know, that you interpret progress as helping to improve all people's lives, right? Because you could, you know, anybody could make that very narrow and say, you know, accelerating progress for our shareholders. But that's definitely not how we intend it. So I think that it's absolutely very, very central is that our people come first. And we have adopted a people first approach with, uh, with everything we do. We actually even have now, I think we're in people first to 6.0 right now. We've, we've come up with a range of different initiatives and, and support. I'd say more than initiatives for our people over the last two years uh, that have really shifted us from, let's say, away from being more focused on a shareholder to much more focused on our people and our communities. I I would also, however, say that we've always been a very community-oriented company. And that that's also, I think, one of the reasons why uh, we've always had a collaborative and caring kind of culture. And that is another one of those things where I say that we've now articulated sort of this this kind of collaboration and care as a output of what we already have. Uh, you'll see that, for example, in, you know, in our people proposition uh, now. But it's, I think it's also another one of those things that was there all along and that we just have now called it out. It's great that you mentioned the business roundtable. We actually start our whole season with a quote uh, around that. What was the process and what was the experience of kind of landing this purpose statement in the culture of the organization? And were you in your L&D role any part of that? I think we need to look at L&D in a slightly different way in our company. We don't even have an L&D function, right? So we, we don't have a learning and development function, not, not in the traditional sense. Uh, learning at S&P Global is actually quite decentralized. So we have business-led learning that is, sits in the divisions. And then we have the, the talent and the leadership space, which is centralized. Then we have a, a group that focuses on culture, right? So I mentioned earlier that we have a head of culture. We, we also then extended that to have a, a head of people engagement as well. If you look at, it's really kind of the sum total of those three groups who have been responsible collectively for, you know, thinking about how do we First of all, how do we engage our people in a dialogue around what our purpose should be? And, and so we went through, um, and it was, it was very much a business led, uh, endeavor as well. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was, you know, relegated to the people function. It was a business leader led initiative where that, that where we went 
There were many, many, many iterations over many months where we had dialogue uh, around what would be uh, also together with our colleagues in the public affairs and corporate communications and branding and thinking there, there were so many different functions involved in kind of thinking about, well, you know, what is it that we do really well? What is it that we want to really focus on? And what is our purpose, right? As opposed to just putting something on paper and then trying to disseminate that. A real dialogue across the whole organization with with leader-led, but lots of participation. Absolutely. Rachel, I'm really interested in um, how that's changed the way you do your job. And if there are sort of specific examples you can give us about how that purpose, that, that definition of purpose has really impacted the overall way you run your people practices. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's changed a lot. The biggest shift that I've seen, I think, as a result of this and, and leading up to it was our people first strategy. So as I mentioned earlier, we came out with this people first 6.0 last week. So that means that we have six iterations of what it means to be people first. So aside from completely transforming our benefits, wow. for example, on the learning side, we now offer tuition reimbursement in the US up to $20,000 a year and from five to promote a learning culture. Right. And that's part of accelerating progress. Right. And so that's a pretty explicit statement. <laughs> that's impressive. Wow. There you go. Yeah. Right. And if you spend 10,000 of that on learning and you happen to have outstanding student loan debt, you can get the, ten, the remaining 10,000 for that year to pay off. We just announced a global care leave policy of six weeks to take care of a child or an elder during COVID 19. And we also just announced that Juneteenth will become a company holiday next year. Right. So those are just a few examples. And I have so many more of what we have done to shift the focus. And of course, we're still focused on our shareholders, right? There's, there's uh, Obviously, we are because we can't do all of these things for our people if we're not in business, right? Really taken this commitment to a whole new level. That's amazing. Are, are there challenges that have, have arisen because of some of these changes that you've made? You know, it's hard to be fully focused on, you know, doing things for our people. We always have to make decisions and trade-offs. And so I, I guess, yes, that you could say that sometimes we do have challenges, you know, and there's always more that we should be doing that we haven't done, right? And I guess one of the things that that happens as a result, you know, you kind of you become a, maybe you become a victim of your own success because there's always more that you can do and more that you should be doing, but we just don't have, we can't do it all and we can't do it all at once. Is it different to be a talent leader in a purpose-driven organization in terms of the impact of having a purpose on the core HR function? I actually love having a purpose like this. I mean, I, you know, we, we, we shouldn't forget that all companies have had a purpose and in the past, it's just maybe that purpose wasn't as altruistic or, you know, as meaningful uh, as, as it might have been. So I actually see, you know, my focus is on enablement and development. And part of my job is to help leaders define at a more granular level what accelerating progress means. And then translate that into an inspiring vision for their organizations and their teams. So I actually really like Simon Sinek's term for vision. He calls it a just cause. And I think that if I can help leaders identify just causes for their own just cause and then get people on board to follow that, which is under the umbrella of the overarching purpose of our company, that's going to be a really good outcome. And it certainly gives me something to hang my hat on. And something that I can feel proud of as well personally, right? Because I want to, I want to do something meaningful with my life and I want to feel like that I'm making an impact and that I'm helping people to do something meaningful and do it better. And so feeling like, like I have something that, you know, like accelerating progress and how I envision that and how I can help leaders to do that, uh, and translate that into something, you know, important for their people. Uh, gives me a sense of purpose as well. So I actually really like it. Can we talk about this year, 2020, um, the global pandemic, the social unrest and the calls for social justice around the world, I think have 
been cause for reflection for pretty much everybody. I wonder how it's impacted your operations and your work so far, at least. Well, I, I would say that COVID in many ways has helped us to accelerate our purpose and also the calls for social justice. In terms of COVID, manager flexibility has been a key topic area. We've expanded our coaching offerings significantly to help managers deal with the challenges of remote work. Actually, we, we had a, a really great alignment with some of the work we were doing around reimagining the performance experience because we were, as part of that and part of some of the experiments that we've been doing in that space, we were also eliminating performance ratings. And uh, a large part of our business chose to eliminate the performance ratings at the at mid-year because the, the whole concept of how could you measure performance in an environment like this? It's just, it takes on such a different a different meaning. And, you know, COVID, it's something that we all, it's, it's something that binds us and that, that we all face together uh, as humanity. But it's also something that plays out in very unique and different ways for each individual. And there are some people who have uh, small children, there are other people who have elderly parents, there are people who had no network access in, in some of the locations where we do business. So being able to do your job just takes on a very different meaning and picking up the slack or, you know, picking up um, areas where your teammates can't work doesn't mean that you should get a better performance rating um, at mid-year. It means that you're a great team player and, and that you've really supported people when they needed it. But to put people at, at a disadvantage because they didn't have a network connection or because they have children who they had to homeschool I think, you know, that's something that we were really looking seriously at and trying to help managers to be able to come up with new ways of support, you know, working with their employees and getting the job done. And, and actually, I think in many ways, our productivity has been through the roof, mm. uh, in spite of all of these challenges and even in spite of not having any, um, given any ratings out in mid year. So that's one area on the COVID side. It seems like you're very optimistic about the future of your organization, and I love, love, love some of the changes that you made. I'm wondering if your organization is viewing them as sort of, especially the things that are wrapped around COVID, if you're seeing them as sort of stop gaps until we get back to normal, or do you think it will literally change the way you do work in the future? I have no doubt that it will change how we do work in the future. I, I mean, look, we all know that the future of work was coming and we all know that in a way it's being accelerated right now. And and we, we have a massive, massive strategic project right now called Project Reimagine, where we are using not only COVID, but also, you know, looking at many things that have happened, you know, recently, including, you know, the calls for social justice as a way of really reimagining how we work in the future. So I think that we're using this as an opportunity. We were already planning on experimenting with no ratings, uh, even pre-COVID, and we're continuing those experiments. In many ways, I, I'm hopeful that these experiments and that, that what happened in COVID naturally will also be encourage us to continue along the path. Are you, um, are you implementing technologies or services or systems? that have been helpful in in this change? We're talking about that now. I, I mean, our, our workplace services is an amazing team. I mean, they got 99% of us up and running in a relatively short period of time uh, remotely. We've always been a very global organization and we We've been, you know, we've had great technologies for for a while, and we know how to work remotely together, et cetera. But but we were not working virtually. You know, there was maybe three percent of us working virtually from three to ninety nine percent in a very short period of time. Wow! Yeah. And they are always experimenting with new technologies, and I've just been in touch with them because also in the manager development space, for example, which is one of the areas that I work on, it's it's very connected to this project reimagine that I was mentioning. And so right now we're looking at, you know, coaching apps and tools and a how to use AI to, to do broad, you know, large scale coaching for managers. So that's that absolutely. I mean, we, we're not doing it yet, but we're certainly looking into it. I'm really, really interested in this project, uh, reimagine. It's now like if I've got this right, you're actually going to be very deliberate in thinking about how you move to whatever the next phase is. And then you're going to take the opportunity of this disruption of this year to sort of rethink what you want 
the work experience to be like? Is that I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that what you're saying? Yeah, 